Good morning, Wildwood. Uh, my name is Bob Bennett, and I am uh, one of the uh, elders here at Wildwood. I'm glad to be with you this morning, both he all of you here and this, those folks online as well. Uh, and as you know, today is the day that we set aside to honor fathers, Father's Day. And uh, uh, fatherhood is a, a frequent teaching <laughs> in the Bible. Uh, and what it teaches mainly is that fathers uh, are incredibly influential. Um, in John 8, Jesus teaches that, uh, that our will is to do what our Father desires. But then he couples that with a warning in that uh, that can work both ways, in that we will do the will of uh, fathers who probably don't deserve to be followed as well. Uh, it just goes to show that fatherhood is, uh, is an influential thing. Um, the power of the role model of a father is really unparalleled. And in Ephesians 5, Paul says that as, uh, as children uh, of the Father, we're uh, uh, exhorted to be imitators of God the Father, who is our best role model. And today, uh, we're going to be hearing about service uh, in, the, uh, in the sermon. And we're reminded that as, uh, as leaders in the family, fathers are called to serve and to love their family sacrificially, as God has done for us. So as we worship today, let's lift our eyes and, uh, and uh, be imitators uh, of God, our Heavenly Father. So please stand as we begin to worship with song.
Oh, you may be seated. Thank you. So Cassidy and Chelsea, would you come up here and, and join me? Um, I'd like to introduce you to, uh, to two young ladies uh, who have answered God's call to service. Uh, and this is our month of, uh, of looking at service. Uh, both are going to be full-time uh, with crew next year as, uh, as interns. They've just graduated from FSU where they participated with, uh, with Rick and Tina Kingsley, uh, our own Rick and Tina Kingsley's uh, crew ministry on campus. And uh, both have been also, uh, if you recognize them, it's because they've been working at Wildwood as well, with, uh, as interning with our children and doing child care for our Tuesday morning women's Bible study. So uh, we have been graced uh, with their service already. Um, Cassidy uh, was introduced to you last week in a video, and she told me that everything that she needed to say was said <laughs> in that video. But, uh, but Chelsea, uh, I would like to give Chelsea a chance to also introduce herself and what, uh, what she's going to be doing. So, Chelsea? Hi, everyone. My name is Chelsea Rivera, and I'm going to be spending the next year serving with crew at Florida State University, and I consider it a deep joy and a deep privilege to go back to my alma mater and share the good news of the gospel at the very place that the Lord brought me really near to him. I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with Florida State and that there's over 40,000 students on that campus, and there are thousands and thousands of students that don't know Jesus. There are thousands of students that are walking in their freshman year trying to figure out what life is going to look like for them. Big questions plague their mind of who will my friends be? What will my major be? What will I do post-grad? But not too many students are thinking, how will the Lord use me in these really pivotal times, these four years here in college? College students' brains and minds are so malleable and teachable when they walk into college, and I, it is my desire that every student on campus has the chance to know and follow Jesus, to hear and respond to the gospel, um, to go from darkness to light in the same way that I was at Florida State. I say this often, that I believe that the Lord used crew to change the trajectory of my entire life, and I am so excited to go back to Florida State's campus and to serve his students, to serve his people. I love the Lord. I love how the Lord uses college students to bring himself near to them, and I am so excited to embark on this new journey. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Uh, as you may realize, both are in the, uh, the midst of uh, fundraising, and uh, you can support them through Wildwood Church. We have uh, added a uh, drop-down box on the giving page that just basically says uh, crew intern missions. So if you would uh, uh, like to, uh, to give them uh, to them or to their ministries in that way, uh, we would love to see that. Uh, so let us uh, pray for them as uh, we send them off to serve. So let's bow. All right. Father God, uh, You've already graced us uh, with the service of these young ladies, and we are just uh, uh, in awe and, and praise of you that you have called them to full-time service. We would pray that even now, uh, as they are uh, contemplating how they will be used in the next year, that you'll just be softening the hearts uh, of all those that they come in contact with, that uh, they will be, uh, we know that the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, prepares the ground uh, for the uh, for the feet and words of the messengers, and we would just pray that even now the Holy Spirit would be preparing the ground for them as they embark on this, uh, this next chapter of service to you. Uh, we would just ask that you would just uh, uh, hold them up, support them, give them, surround them with, uh, with love and fellowship uh, from other Christians, uh, that you would protect them from the evil one, and that you would uh, always bless them and, and just allow us uh, uh, to just uh, be privileged to participate in their ministry in some small way. So as we send them forward, we would just, uh, just ask that you would just uh, be at FSU and be at the, uh, the location that, uh, that Cassidy is going to be at. Uh, again, just preparing hearts uh, for them to uh, uh, share the gospel uh, with those that you would have here at. And uh, just for our own reminder... As good Presbyterians, we often uh, think of the elect, uh, but what we don't always realize is that there is possibly just as many of the elect that have not yet heard the gospel as there are within this building that have heard the gospel and responded. So we would just ask that you would just uh, remind us uh, that, uh, that you do uh, send messengers forth, and that is the way you've chosen uh, to spread the word. 
And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you would like to speak to them after the, after the service, they're both going to be out in the lobby. Uh, and they, uh, they will have additional literature if you want to uh, learn a little bit more about their missions. So thank you, ladies. Okay. Uh, let's continue our service with our tithes and offerings. us through life's ups and through life's downs. God, what a privilege it is to be your children. God, help us to turn our hearts to you. Help us to embrace the uh, loving Father that you are. And, um, and as we hear your word today, remind us that we are your precious children. It's in Jesus' name. 
a mission trip got me here. Went to a mission trip down in uh, Brazil and uh, out there in the middle of the jungle, middle, middle of the Amazon River, looking at the beautiful sky at the Milky Way and, and it just dawned on me that we don't have to go halfway around the world to be missional. We can do it right here in Tallahassee in our home area. Well, I'm Ellen Hicks. I've been doing OFS for probably six years now. I'm uh, Scott McAnally. Uh, I've been involved with OFS since uh, 2011. So what's that, uh, 11 years? Prayed for an opportunity, came back to town and uh, just happened to be the time that uh, the uh, founder of OFS was stepping down and, and uh, there's a slot open and, and just joined the team and felt led uh, to be a part of it, and it's been very exciting. It's been very, uh, uh, I would say, encouraging to my spiritual walk in many ways. Uh, I was not comfortable sitting down, really talking and praying with people out loud, but uh, now it's it's second nature. I don't think about it at all. So it's been a great experience for me and my family. It keeps me focused where I need to be focused, loving people, and of course, um, there are days come to OFS. You're tired, had a rough day, and you don't feel like. Uh, really doing it, but as soon as you sit down and just talk with uh, the volunteers and talk with the people that join us, our friends here in our community, it's uh, it just, it's uplifting and it's amazing how many of our friends that come will sit down and pray for us. So it's, uh, it's a great experience and I love it and I'm so glad that I'm a part of this program. I see OFS as part of Wildwood's ministry to serve freely. And this is the place where you get an opportunity to actually sit down with people and listen to their heart and listen to their needs and know that you can do something for them right then. Pray with them, listen to them, know that the people are going to leave with groceries, with clothing if they need it, with a lot of spiritual support and love. And to me, this is one of our most important ministries at Wildwood because these are the people that are all around us. We have small communities all around us that are in need. And you don't know what that need is until you come here and you meet these people and you talk to them and you hear, oh, you know, I lost my job. I'm, you know, I can't feed my family. I can do something to help. And just praying for these people, like Scott said, it just, it feeds your spiritual self to be able to pray with these people. And at first, you know, when I first started coming, it was a little awkward. It was a little intimidating. I didn't know any of these people. But you sit down and you find out they're just like me. And I've been where they are. I've struggled with those things, so I can identify with that. And to be able to pray with them, it just, you all you have to do is sit down and open your heart and God does the rest. I think everybody uh, through the last couple of years particularly feel kind of isolated to some degree. And it's just an opportunity to be in community where we can love people, you know. And there's many ways to plug in at OFS. Um, obviously our Tuesday night events is uh, a big need where we need people to um, just to greet people, talk to them, be friendly. Um, if you're comfortable, you can sit down and pray with people, uh, provide uh, some level of counseling. We always need people to give out groceries, uh, pack groceries. Um, but on the night, we, you know, we need people to uh, help with the clothes and, uh, of course, uh, carry groceries out to cars and, and, and help us get keep the carts uh, running. And we need donations. You know, we always need donations, monetary and the clothing and all of that, you know. We just, I want the people to know that this church is willing to serve freely and to love on people. And it doesn't matter who they are, where they come from, what their background is. This church is going to be willing to open its heart and to help. You know, something that uh, not everybody may, may know is uh, OFS is not part of the church budget. So um, it is just specified giving to OFS. So uh, the church has supported this since 2005, and it's, it's been fantastic to have this kind of ministry right here in our church. You know, I think about it a lot. You know, Jesus says, go and make disciples. Well, when I meet Jesus face to face, 
and he says, where are your disciples? I want to be able to say that, hey, I did what I was supposed to do. Molokai is a hot spot for tourists. It's known for its quiet charm and its gentle breezes and soft surf. I've never been, uh, but I hear it's one of the more beautiful uh, islands of Hawaii. But that's not why Father Damien came to the island. He actually came to the island to serve people that were going to die. He came to Molokai because leprosy came there first. No one knows the exact time when it first arrived, but the first documented case was around 1840. As many of you know, leprosy is a horrible disease marked by uh, disfigurement and decay and panic. Well, the government of Hawaii responded to this disease with a, a civil version of Old Testament segregation. They put the disease on this triangular thrust of land surrounded on uh, three sides uh, by water, the fourth by a towering seawall. It was a natural prison. It was hard to get to and harder still to get away from. These lepers lived a discarded existence in shanties with minimal food. Ships would draw close to the shore and sailors would uh, dump supplies into the water hoping that they would float towards the land. Society sent a very clear message to these lepers, you aren't valuable anymore. But Father Damien's message was different. He had already served in ministry on the island for a decade when in 1873 at the age of 33 he felt called to serve and to sacrifice and to go live among these poor lepers. And so he immersed himself in their uh, world, dressing their sores and hugging uh, their children and burying the dead. His choir members sang through rags and congregants received communion with stumped hands. But because they mattered to God, they mattered to Father Damien. When he referred to his congregation, he didn't even say, "Uh, my brothers and sisters, but he said, we lepers. He became one of them, literally. Somewhere along the way, through either a touch of kindness or the sharing of a communion wafer, the disease passed from member to priest. Damien became a leper. And in the spring of 1889, just four days shy of Good Friday, He died of leprosy. Now we've learned to treat leprosy today. We don't quarantine people anymore. We've done away with such settlements. But have we done away with the attitude? Do we still see people as inferior or those people? And I often wonder, are there any more Father Damien's who are motivated by the gospel, who are filled with compassion to serve those in need. We're in our third week now of our Living Scent series. If you missed any, I encourage you to to go back and maybe catch a listen and maybe look at uh, more specifically the application points each week because uh, so far we've discovered in week one our calling to be a good neighbor. What does it mean to live as a good neighbor? And then last week we looked at our gifting. How do we leverage how God has shaped us out to serve in the kingdom? And so we get this idea of living sent directly from Jesus in the high priestly prayer where he prayed over his disciples and over us as his followers as I have, you have sent me into the world, so I am sending them into the world the world. Well, this morning we're going to explore the power of the towel. And if you're willing and able, I invite you to stand with me in honor of God's Word. Our text this morning found in John chapter 13. John 13, starting in the first verse, we read, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that His hour had come to depart out of this world and to the Father, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. 
During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. But Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Well, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet also, but but also my hands and and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That's why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments, he resumed his place and he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you are right, for so I am. If then I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, You also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Let's pray this morning. Father, we see this important moment in the life of our Savior, Jesus. There's so much going on here that we need to explore and understand more to know who you are and who you're what your heart is and what the mission is, but also the example that you have set for us and how to order our lives and how we are to live. Father, none of this makes sense devoid of a relationship with you. We won't even really understand what it means to serve and give our lives away until we have been served by the one who gave his life away for us. And so, Jesus, I would pray for any hearts that are far from you this morning that you would open their spiritual eyes to see their great need, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, God, that they would pass from death to life. Father, for those of us that know you, as always, we don't come to your word just wanting to know more. We're not merely seeking information. We're seeking transformation that we could be made to live more like you, Jesus, our great Savior, in whose name we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. Now, so you have a frame of reference where this takes place in the Gospels is what we know of of as Passion Week. Uh, On Sunday of that week, Jesus had triumphantly entered into uh, the city being praised, hosannas being uh, sung, palm branches being uh, laid down, the people honoring Him. And now it's Thursday of that week, the night that Jesus would eat His final meal with His disciples instituting what we know and celebrate as the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, communion. We do it to remember and to mark what Jesus instituted. But then in this often overlooked part of Passion Week, we have this seemingly random scene of of Jesus washing His disciples' feet. Like, what's that all about? And why is that in here? And the whole picture here is Jesus showing His disciples, this is what love looks like. Because to love someone else is to serve someone else. To love someone is to stoop for them, to care for them, to do the unexpected, to take the place of a servant with great compassion for those you love. And so I I want you to encourage you to think this morning. And not just to think kind of big uh, global thoughts or kind of the big picture or just kind of let this be an ambiguous kind of picture or principle for you. But I really want you to engage with our text this morning and, and, and think, how can you serve somebody in a way that shows this kind of love? An unexpected, surprising, stooping, serving kind of love. I challenge you to think with me, who can I do this for? What can I do to express this kind of love? Jesus said to us, I've washed your feet, so you also 
ought to wash one another's feet. I've given you an example so that you should do as I've done for you. Literally, is that what he means? Figuratively, spiritually? Well, let's explore some truths and challenges and applications from our text this morning. And the first is this, the towel is a symbol of a transformed life. See, the first century had a culture that was very similar to ours today. It was built on power and prestige and success. It's honestly how most cultures operate today. Think about it. The more you're known and the more status you uh, possess, the less that's actually expected of you. Or, or when you reach a certain level of wealth, then, then people all of a sudden just want to give you stuff for free when the reality is you have enough money to buy whatever you want. Think about when you achieve a certain level of power. The more power you have, what? The greater expectation is that those below you would come and they would cater to you and they would serve you. But then Jesus shows up and turns everything upside down. He, he constantly confronts cultural views and he shows how the kingdom of God doesn't operate with the culture's values. The kingdom of God leverages power not, not to be served, but to serve those that are around us, those who have been given much in the kingdom of God when it comes to resources, more is actually required of them, not less, that they steward those resources well, that they give with radical generosity to swagger. Is there such thing in the kingdom of God? There's no status. We don't walk with, with swagger. We, we find our identity and our value in how we serve one another. It's not about seeing me. It's not about pointing people to me. And to make it perfectly clear, Jesus says to us, hey, I've set the example before you. So now you go out and live these kingdom values like I have. Now, the truth is we can't wash someone else's feet until our heart has been washed. Our heart must be transformed before our serving is transformed. And I have good news for you this morning. Jesus still washes feet. Jesus loves those who don't love him. He, he serves those who feel too unworthy for his love and service. And he loves those that don't even see their need those that may even feel above the need to have Jesus. See, before we can receive this great news of who Jesus is and what He's done, though, we have to come to terms with the bad news. And the bad news is us, isn't it? Well, we can't save or fix ourselves. Despite our best efforts, we can't clean up our act. We've tried Our heart is the dirty feet. Our heart is stained with sin. See, really, inside this powerful example of serving, uh, uh, Jesus serving is the heart of the gospel, is it not? The reality is we need more than our feet cleaned, and, and Peter recognized that. Why he blurts out, well, then wash every part of me. <laughs> Cleanse me. I, I, I need this. We, we need our heart washed clean by the cleansing blood of Jesus so that we can serve. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish of God, why? To purify our conscience from dead works so that we can serve the living God. And so don't miss this this morning. Serving is not what you do. A servant is who you are. What we're talking about here is identity, we're talking about transformation that has to take place, your identity that's been changed because of Jesus. And so then the towel, how and why you serve, is really the evidence of a life that's been transformed. The second thing we see from our text this morning is that the towel is really a pathway towards purposeful humility now, the washing of feet was a, a necessary custom in this time, especially when gathering for a communal meal. You can only imagine what you would pick up on your feet as most travel in those days was by foot, dirty, dusty, unpaved roads, the same road that cattle would have 
traveled or other animals would have uh, been sharing. And then culturally, these meals would take place at a table, a table though not like ours, one that would be low to the ground, and so feet would be in close proximity to the food. Enjoy your lunch later today with that thought. (laughs) So for the disciples, kind of, this wasn't a far-reaching practice, right? This was a very common cultural practice. Coming to most homes, it was proper hospitality to offer your guests a a basin of water in order to wash their feet. Uh, Now, washing the dirt off someone's feet, though, was a task that was reserved for the lowest ranking of the Gentile servants. Jewish slaves, in fact, were often even exempted uh, from this duty, And in a household where there were no slaves, everyone would wash his or her own feet. Yet, here we see Jesus dropping to His knees in this position of the lowest of low when it comes to servants, the lowest of low when it comes to slaves to wash His disciples' feet. And the disciples were immediately shocked. It seems even embarrassed by this act of humility Because there would have been no instance in Jewish or Greco-Roman society where there would be a superior washing the feet of an inferior. It would have never taken place. And here we have the creator of the universe down on his knees, washing the dirt from the callous feet of his followers. Look with me at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. We read, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he didn't count equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on what? The form of a slave, the form of a a servant, being born in the likeness of men. See, this stunning act of of humble love as Jesus washes uh, the feet of His disciples resulted not from Jesus forgetting who He was, but Jesus actually remembering who He was. See, this was the holy mission of our servant Savior, willing to enter into the human condition, becoming like uh, us, and being willing to do the most debased thing letting go of all of his rights, his position, his power, all of the things that were rightfully his in order to stoop low. Why? So that you and I could be redeemed. It was his high and his holy calling. And I would tell you this morning, it was the only way. And so Jesus' identity uh, as the Son of God didn't lead him to be arrogant or entitled unwilling to do what needed to be done for redemption to be accomplished. His identity didn't cause him to to assess that, hey, I'm, I'm too good for that. That's a little bit beneath me. But rather, his identity motivated and propelled him to do what even the disciples were convinced was below them and beneath them, something they were unwilling to do. And I would say to you this morning, the grace of this humble one is your only hope, especially as you face the ever-present temptation of of self-glory and making much of yourself, having people see you and, and know you. And so we have to battle against what our nature desires. And I'll tell you, this isn't easy. This runs against the grain of everything inside of us that's not in Christ. In fact, our default mode, have you noticed, is to be able to spot the weaknesses of others so that we can exploit them in order to raise ourselves up? Do you see that in you? We're constantly putting ourselves on uh, the scales of superiority against people around us. Here's what I do well. Here's what you do poorly. And that's why I'm better than you. That's why I also should need to serve you or, or help you, because I'm in a different place in my life than where you are. We're at different stations, if you will. Can I remind you, you will always have people around you based on your own evaluation that are above you or on par with you or even below you. But how you serve them 
And how you treat them matters greatly to God. And so we need Jesus' example. We need to see why Jesus left uh, his throne and where he was served by angels and he comes to earth in humility. And then at dinner, Jesus gets off his seat and gets on his knees to serve in humility. And he calls us to be a life marked by serving in humility. I've always been challenged by um, the words of the great German reformer, Nicholas Zinzendorf, who said, preach the gospel, die and be forgotten. Isn't that challenging? Even inside, we kind of think, "Mm, be forgotten? (laughs) I kind of want to be known for the things that I've done. I kind of like when people observe me serving and and doing good things. But maybe in our context this morning as a faith family, we could say, serve the gospel, die and be forgotten. And maybe, just maybe, that could be one of the greatest testimonies ever said of our life. Everywhere we go, and with all humility, serving others with the good news of the gospel, with no thought of even being remembered, but that only people would see Jesus. The third thing we see this morning is that the towel is a testimony of compassionate love. See, what makes Christianity different than any other faith is that we don't serve in order to earn the favor of God. We don't give money or pray a certain number of times. We don't make a pilgrimage. We simply aren't trying to stack up good deeds. See, the Christian faith doesn't ask us to build a resume so that we can list out what we've done for God so that one day we can say, hey, I'm in. I've made it. God, look at all these things uh, that I have done. Christian faith is actually the opposite. It's not what we do, but it's what the one who He's done for us, right? It's what Jesus has done for us. We don't serve so that God will love us, but we serve because He already loves us. We don't strive and serve in order to earn our salvation. We serve to show our salvation. We serve because we have been served. So I would say, Christ follower, you are in process. You are being conformed into the image of Jesus, and Jesus patterned a life of service that He has called for you to follow. And while I would say He most certainly is interested in action, what we do, can I remind you, though, He is far more interested in your motivation Even as 1 Samuel reminds us, the Lord, when He sees, He sees differently. Man looks at the outer, right? Whether that be the appearance or or what we do, look at all this stuff that I'm doing, but what does the Lord look at? He looks past that to see the motivations of our heart. That's what He's after. And so, all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, God is challenging uh, His people when it comes to their motivations. In fact, there's many times throughout Old Testament and and New Testament where God gets after His people for simply checking the boxes, right? Simply doing their religious motions with a heart that was hardened against Him. And so this is where we take warning when it comes to our heart. Because we all know we can just kind of flip the switch, right, and do the right thing especially those of us who are hard chargers, super Christian people pleaser, type A uh, personalities, we especially need to be on guard. And I can so easily fall into this trap, hearing the Lord say, Todd, why are you doing this for me? Hmm, Is it because of the right thing to do? I don't know, so people would see me I'm trying to work towards something, uh, somehow a continual uh, grace needed from, from the Lord. Now, don't hear me wrongly. Sometimes in our faith journey, there is a discipline that leads to delight. Sometimes we do the right thing, even if our heart isn't always 
in it, knowing that God produces delight as we serve Him. But we always have to be aware of our heart. Are you serving because your heart has been changed? Are we serving because we have been filled with the compassion and love of Jesus? One of our axioms as I led our student ministry here was reminding our team that we do ministry out of the overflow of our heart, which means you, you can't give if nothing, you can't have outflow if nothing is uh, coming in. It's an important reminder that who you are is more important than what you do because what you do flows from who you are. Do you see the distinction? We want to be filled with the love of Jesus because out of the overflow of that love is our ability to serve and do ministry well. Focusing on your heart prepares you to pick up the towel and wash feet. We read in verse 1 of Jesus, having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. Jesus' compassionate love for us led Him to serve us But Jesus wasn't done showing us how to love one another when He finished washing His disciples' feet because He put down the basin and He put down the towel, and what did He do next? He picked up the cross. The Son of Man willingly came to earth as a lowly slave to serve us, to be crushed for us, to free us from the sin and slavery that leads to eternal death. And there on his knees with his disciples, he enacts for us the parable of the cross. He's giving them a picture of what was coming in just a few short moments. Because at the cross, we see that compassionate love suffers when it serves others. At the cross, it it certainly costs Jesus something to serve. And can I remind you, it'll cost you something too. If it's Jesus-fueled, Holy Spirit-filled serving, it'll be costly. But what a testimony. As we serve others, we give visible witness to God's amazing and saving love. It started out for a, as a normal Easter Sunday for me when I was a child. Other than on our way home from church, I noticed we weren't going home like we normally did. We were actually headed downtown. I was in elementary school, and instead of gathering for our our traditional Easter Sunday uh, with family, my parents uh, decided to uh, take us to a lunch gathering that was taking place downtown. I remember being a child and walking into what seemed like the largest room I had ever seen The sights and and smells honestly were a bit overwhelming people for as far as my eyes could see. Hundreds upon hundreds of men and women and kids who didn't look like me were sitting down at tables. We walked over to the serving line where my brother and I took our place as we walked down and uh, servers put food on uh, the plates and we delivered them to these men and women and children that had gathered. They were homeless. They were the less fortunate of Jacksonville. I can still see some of their faces in my mind. And then what was probably most impactful, as we served them, we got plates ourselves and sat with them and ate with them. It was an Easter meal uh, I've never forgotten, and I don't remember everything that was said, but I remember my parents talking and engaging. I remember listening to their stories and, and hearing the hard lives that they had been living, the joy that was on their face and the gratitude to have a hot meal, an Easter meal that Sunday. And probably what pressed deep down inside of my heart in that moment and what could only come from the Holy Spirit was a a genuine Jesus-given compassion to be able to sit with them and see them and listen to them and love them in ways that my little mind and heart probably didn't fully understand. I don't know that I was fully aware that I was picking up 
a towel that day. But I was aware that there was a love growing inside me that only could come from Jesus. See, the towel is how we show God's love. The fourth thing we see this morning is the towel is a validation of obedient lordship. What if I told you this morning that your truest form of worship is actually your obedience? Of all the ways that we can worship, I think the truest way we worship is obeying. Obeying our Lord. John chapter 13 lays it out for us, a new commandment I give you. Jesus says that we should love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Dirty feet being washed clean and sinless feet being nailed to a cross spell out love in these verses with such clarity. This kind of love involves servant hearts and hands that are unexplainably humble and intentional and self-sacrificing, free from the world's standards and expectations. And so when we look to our Savior, it challenges us, what? To give more than we thought we could give. Sacrificing time and money and energy, knowing that God supplies all that we need in order to serve Him faithfully. Well, we cancel plans, and we do so joyfully to spend time uh, with someone who is in need. We make last-minute adjustments so that we can be a, a listening ear or a good friend. We keep initiating hard conversations, even with loved ones. Even when the conversations only seem to be getting harder and harder, we invite others in, maybe even strangers, allowing them to stay with us for an unexpected night or more. We set aside our preferences to bless someone that may have different desires than us. We constantly consider others' needs and, and, and interests as important as our own. We regularly seek opportunities to show and to serve the love of Christ to the least of these. As we move about in our daily life, we just simply do it with spiritual eyes wide open. Why do we do these things? We pick up the towel because it shows who the Lord of our life is. Listen, if you are a follower of Jesus in here this morning, you need to remember that you are not a spiritual consumer but you're a spiritual contributor. The church does not exist for you. This church, Wildwood Church, does not exist for you. We are the church, and out of love, we exist for the needs of other people. And we do this to be obedient to what the Lord has asked of us. And so don't forget, church, you are never more like Jesus than when you serve. When you serve those in need. And, and as you're serving others you'll find that God always changes lives. And the first life He usually changes is yours. In the early 1900s in rural Grayson County, Texas, there was a woman by the name of Edna who stumbled upon this uh, farm. It was called the Grayson County Poor Farm. It was little more than a dumping ground for the feeble-minded, handicapped mentally ill and unwanted children there in Texas. She was appalled by the conditions, and she had an incredible heart to serve these children. In fact, she personally made it her mission to clean up the farm, and would later see that farm disbanded and all the children moved to the Texas children's home. Little did she know, but she would later eventually become the superintendent of that children's home. And so she made uh, the very center of her being to serve the unwanted children of her county. And her goal was to place all of these unwanted children with loving, adoptive families. But there was one thing that really bothered her. On the birth certificates of all of these children was stamped the word illegitimate. She would work for three years 
to lobby and to petition the Texas legislature to re- re- remove the term illegitimate from birth certificates. And in 1936, she was successful because she couldn't stand the thought of any child growing up and living with that label. You see, Edna Gladney was born to a 17-year-old mother, and she never knew her biological father. Edna learned the power of grabbing a towel and stooping down to love and care for children, children who needed the love and the care the most. Faith family, Jesus' teaching on servant, serving, and and greatness is so needed now. And my prayer for us as a church is that this idea of we want thrones, it's got to give way to we will wash feet as our servant Savior did. To get rid of this idea of we want thrones, we want power, we want prestige to, no, no, we will wash feet. That's what we're going to be about. And I believe with all my heart that if the church will major on serving, we will once again earn the credibility to speak into those in power. To speak into a, a watching world because why? Serving is shocking When the world sees us stoop down uh, to serve, to give our lives away, to care for, to show compassion for others, it sends a powerful gospel message. So let's be the church that will wash feet. Be challenged to pick up your towel even this week. For some helpful ideas on how to do that, let me encourage you to follow the link at the bottom of your sermon notes. It's also available on the screen as we serve. Let's pray together. Father, there is power in the towel. It's not a power that the world sees and values, but it's one that you, Jesus, our Savior, modeled for us. And Father, in all of our lives, we realize we have such a long way to grow here. Father, we're thankful for your grace that continues to call us and woo us and and, and compel us to think clearly with our eyes set on the cross why we would serve, why we would give our lives away, why we would pick up a towel and a basin of water and kneel down to serve. And there are so many opportunities that exist right here in this church, in our neighborhoods, in the communities where we live, in our city, and most certainly to the very ends of the earth. And Father, my prayer for us is that you would help us by the grace that you have given to us and the power of the Holy Spirit in us, that you would flip the values in our own hearts. Forgive us where we've embraced the cultural values that that cause us to say, we want thrones We want power. We want prestige. We want to be seen. God, may even this morning we abandon that and lay that at your feet and simply say, we want to serve. We want the towel. We want to stoop low like our Savior has. Father, again, for those that are far from you, this doesn't happen without having a life-changing interaction with you through Jesus. Father, for those of us that know you, Would you motivate us and compel us to pick up the towel and serve? We pray in the mighty name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen. As we close out our service, would you stand and sing together? Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart.
Well, we've got some of our ministry leaders that are down front. They would love nothing more than to pray with you, to encourage you, to talk with you. If you've got spiritual questions, God's doing something in your heart, we would love to uh, walk that journey with you. Uh, again, happy Father's Day uh, today. I know that that's a day uh, that sometimes can come with some mixed feelings there, um, but I do pray that you feel loved and well uh, celebrated uh, today. Uh, make that phone call uh, if you can and, and let your dad know just how much you love and, and appreciate them. And ultimately, this all falls under uh, the bigger umbrella that we have an amazing, loving Heavenly Father. Amen who loves us and cares for us. And so we celebrate our dads today. And also happy June 19th, uh, a day that we mark in our country to celebrate freedom of a different kind. But again, ultimately all freedom found in uh, Jesus Christ. So receive the benediction. May the grace and strength of the power of the Holy Spirit enable you to stoop low this week, to pick up a towel, and to serve those in need. Amen. Take your towel, go in God's grace and peace today. Amen.